And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Advent conspiracy. Last week we, we talked about encouraging this countercultural act of keeping Jesus' birth at the center of our holiday activities. Last week we talked about worshiping fully by taking up the worshipful attributes of some of the key players in the Christmas story. So in the next few weeks, are we like Mary who offered herself? Are we like Joseph who obeyed? Or are we like the shepherds who left their busyness to go and worship the Christ? So now we turn to the idea of spending less and giving more. Three six-year-old boys were playing the wise men in their church Christmas program. As they came up to Mary and Joseph, they came up to the stable and the first one handed over his president and he said, gold. And the second one comes up and he hands over his president and he goes, myrrh. And the third one comes up and he gives his treasure and he goes, and Frank sent this. <laughs> Now let's face it, most of us like to get presents. I, I would say that most of us like to give presents. You know, we who are parents want to please our children and so we buy and we buy and then we charge and then we charge and then we figure out how we're going to pay for it later. What do you think pleased the Lord the most? Do you think it was the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh? that the Magi brought? Or do you think that it was the fact that they spent two years journeying to find him? Two years, probably, <coughs> coming to find this child who was to be king. Now, Black Friday shopping, that's already behind us, but the Advent Conspiracy's challenge remains this, to let the gift of Jesus' birth ensure us that we spend less at Christmas and yet give more this year. So who's on your list? What's on your list? Are you excited? Are you stressed? Or somewhere in between all the Christmas shopping and the wrapping and the giving and the returning and the credit card bills? For all the fun and the joy that presents can be, I wonder this. How many of you remember what you received for Christmas five years ago? What about one year ago? I want to acknowledge that when we talk about our habits of giving and receiving gifts, we're wading into personal territory. Because gift giving is one of the most significant ways that we try to show our love for other people. And love is always personal. To the personal nature of gift gilding, spending less on Christmas presents doesn't mean we love our friends and family any less. And the conspiracy is not trying to take Christmas traditions away. Economically speaking, spending less does not mean spending nothing. Rather, the spend less of Advent conspiracy is a challenge to thoughtfully evaluate what we're supporting and what we're spending. What's the impact our gift has on the person we're giving it to? Whether or not we are taking our gift, giving cues from the gift God gave it as Christ. Is that our cue to do our giving? Or is our giving because, well, she gave me something last year, so I better get her something. Sifting through the piles of things we don't need and won't ever use Something deep inside us tells us that we've missed it. Whatever it is, our soul longs for this time of year. May, many reach the end of the Advent season with an emptiness. And so to rebel against some of the craziness by spending less, it can seem right on a lot of levels. Spend less on meaningless things. But the challenge doesn't stop there because gift giving can be a beautiful thing. 
The full challenge is to spend less, but to give more of what really matters. And how do we do that? What if we, what does that moment on Christmas morning look like? The impact on um, what givers and receivers give and do beyond the day that they open the presents. Somebody on Facebook last week asked, what's the most meaningful Christmas gift you ever received? And some of the ones that I liked was a homemade quilt by my grandmother. A loaf of banana bread given to a grandchild. A video of memories from your childhood. I wonder how you would answer that question this morning. What was it that's touched you? Over the years, are there gifts that you got that are still powerful to you? Why do you still remember it after all those years? Now, this is just a guess, but you probably aren't remembering a gift card for a shop at the mall. And you're probably not remembering a huge diamond bracelet hanging on the tree. For most of us, that special gift we best remember is a different kind of gift. It's a relational gift. The best gifts are relational. For me, for me, the best Christmas gift I ever got was Kristen. A gift I was not expecting that day. <laughs> Christmas Eve, 2001, we'd had a beautiful service. Sherry is eight and a half, nine months pregnant, and she's singing the Magnificat beautifully. And we go home, and we wrap presents, and we stay up late. And, well, she stays up late. <laughs> Nick, Nick was almost five. I was having to hold Nick in the bed because every time he heard something creak, he thought Santa was coming. Relational gifts are the things you remember. This is in my office all the time. This little thing, it says raising kids is no big deal. Um, it's just a nice little poem that Kristen made in church one day. I keep that in there. I keep a picture of her holding an Astros baseball bat. Just one of hers in a little Eskimo Joe shirt. And this was one of my favorite Christmas pictures when she was just a little bitty. We remember the memories. We remember the people. You know, I don't keep that frame because it's great art. I keep it because she made it for me. So when I look at these things from her childhood, I'm reminded that she loves me and that's worth celebrating. A couple of years ago, a number of us decided to go out and learn a dance and freeze to death so that somebody could propose. That was a great Christmas present for all of us. It's the relational things. But we live in the real world that oftentimes, in order for a gift to seem significant, it has to be expensive because that's what we've been taught. I don't know if it happened gradually or just sometime over the years, something has happened that we forgot about why we give. You know, God's answer to the world's problems has never been in material things. God didn't send down stuff. God sent down Emmanuel. God with us. And so what if we work to make our main inspiration for giving gifts at Christmas the reason for Christmas itself. 
that Christ came into the world as a gift for us. And that's why we want to share with others. What if we let the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, as Paul says in Philippians, and we ask that any purchase we make, what do you think of all this, Jesus? Is how we're celebrating your birthday what you would have in mind? We heard last week the writer uh, of the Gospel of John, and in the beginning was the Word, and the word was, God, word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through him. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot, will not, did not overcome it. Epic words. A bit abstract. But it gets to the heart of this radical and risky act of love that is the incarnation. The word came, became flesh and dwelled among us. That is a universe-sized God who had no reason to do it, chose to become like us. Alan Hirsch, I love the way he puts this. He said that the epic-sized God moved into our neighborhood in an act of humble love, the likes of which the world has never known. This Incarnation is what we celebrate when we gather for worship, what becomes tangible for us as we share bread and wine. The reason for the season is God drawing near to us. I think there's four things we can learn. First is God gave us his presence, Emmanuel, God with us. But do we allow that Emmanuel reality to permeate the way we live during this season and throughout the year? Could it be possible that even our gift giving could be drenched with this beautiful moment when God gave us his presence in a unique way? In an era of shared Google calendars and off the charts monthly family agendas and I know our we're calendaring every week we calendar because we have to figure out who's going where when time is perhaps the most precious commodity we have we have a need to be with each other to hear another voice to see another face to hold another hand when we make time to be together our presence is a present a relational gift. The second thing is Jesus's, the gift of Jesus was personal. The announcement that the angels make in Luke's gospel that you heard Linus read almost twice. To you is born this day in the city of David a Messiah, the Lord. A Savior born for you. A very personal gift. We've all given and received gifts that were less than personal, right? Generic disposable gifts that partially scream, I haven't thought about you in a long time, but I still felt obligated to buy you something. <coughs> Relational giving means we pay attention to the other person. We think about who they are and why they need what we're giving them. It's not about size or cost. It's about content. In case you're wondering, yes, this is a more difficult way of giving. Because it's easy to just go buy everybody a gift card. The third one is the gift of Christ was costly. As Paul reminds us in Philippians again, in Christ, God emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. Didn't force his way in as a powerful king, but came in the humblest of ways that led to a life of teaching and led to being martyred on a cross. The gift God gave was relational and sacrificial. But what does that tell us about giving for us? 
Giving should cost us something, and I'm not talking this. Relational gifts cost us time and energy. It would be easier to stop by a store, go online, and grab that gift card. Buy something cheap. Spending less and giving more in a way is a way that honors Christ at Christmas by intentional intentionality and planning. Here's some real examples I ran across this week. I love these. How about this? You give a pound of coffee to someone. And a pound of coffee is just a pound of coffee until you give it to someone and say, only you and I can drink this. And we can only drink it when we're together. And when we do, we're really going to talk and listen to one another. You and I together. So if you give your child some coffee and say, but I don't want you to just drink this anytime. This is our time. How about a cookbook? A cookbook is just a cookbook until you tell your grandchild, your grandson or your granddaughter, this cookbook is a special one because it's mine and yours. And we're going to go through the whole thing together and I'm going to teach you how to make every one of these things, you and me together. It's more than a cookbook then, isn't it? I have to say Lois does this very well, especially for birthdays. She's got six grandchildren and when their birthday comes around, she doesn't go to their birthday party. She just she quit doing that. They schedule a day. Each grandchild spends the day with grandma and grandpa doing whatever they want to do. And sometimes it's go shopping and sometimes it's this. Uh, last year, Kristen, didn't you make pillowcases? Learned how to sew pillowcases. It's a day, uh, and Caroline always wants to bake bread. And you know, some of the ones, most of them are wanting to learn how to cook from grandma and do things. You made noodles one year, didn't you? Think about those things. This year, let's give differently. Let's allow ourselves to experience God's presence in our lives and in the lives of everyone around us. Let's bring ourselves daily to Christ and give him the best of ourselves so that we can give the best of ourselves to others. And let's commit to giving our presence to one another. Commit to giving as Jesus gave to us. We can do this, right? My prayer for each of us is that this Christmas we might experience moments of relational giving that our friends and our family will care about and remember. So next year, when somebody asks, what did you get last year for Christmas? Somebody's going to go, well, we're still experiencing it. I want the children in our lives that they will learn from us what it means to give gifts in a different way. I want our neighbors and our coworkers to be watching us and going, what are they doing? I want them to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, not because you've told them, but because you've shown them. The word became flesh and still dwells among us as a gift. A gift for your family. A gift for the whole human family. And that's the fourth thing that we can learn about God's gift of Christ. It was for all. How we worship fully and spend less and give more and love all at Christmas. And love all is next week. May God bless the decisions that we make about our gift giving. Amen.